Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, it is chilly up here, isn't it? We'll be awake. Yeah. We'll be fast. Exactly. All right. All right, so lo let's go ahead and get started. Um, perhaps slightly inspired by Tina Turner, um, let's start today's event entitled What's Youth Got to Do With It? Investing in Youth Sexual and Reproductive Health. Uh, my name is Sandeep Pathala. I'm a Senior Program Associate here at the Wilson Center with our Maternal Health Initiative and the Environmental Change and Security Program. Today's event would not have been possible without the support of the Youth Health and Rights Coalition, which is a co coalition of 28 advocacy and implementing organizations who, in collaboration with young people and adult allies, are working to advance the sexual and reproductive health and rights of adolescents. The coalition is co-chaired by Pathfinder International as well as Planned Parenthood Federation of America. And I know right here actually in the front row we have some of the representatives here if you have any specific questions that you do want to pose to them. I also wanted to take a minute to especially thank Kiki Kalkstein and Jonathan Rux of Pathfinder International who started talking to me about this event, I would say like six months ago. <laughs> it might not be an exaggeration. So we've been very excited to welcome you all here today. And we do hope that you got a chance to enjoy a cookie beforehand outside the auditorium, of course. Um, <laughs> So today's event is actually also brought to you as part of our cooperative agreement with the USAID's Office of Population and Reproductive Health. And through that cooperative agreement, we look at the various connections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. And within the Office of Population and Reproductive Health, this event also would not have been possible without Kate Lane, who's the Youth Advisor's um, help and assistance as well. Uh, so speaking of the Wilson Center a bit, I wanted to tell you that you are sitting in the auditorium of one of the top think tanks to watch in the United States and one of the 10 best in the, in the world. So consider yourself lucky and we do thank you for, for ensuring that, that, that we do have that rating. Um, I wanted to just point out that um, today's event is being webcast live. For what, so what that means for those of you in the room is that when we do get to the discussion, I'd ask that you use a mic um, for your questions and my colleagues will be around with them. And please introduce yourself and affiliation. I also wanted to point out, it's um, on that slide as well, but we are using two different hashtags today. If you want to join the chatter on Twitter, investing in youth and repro health are the two. If you need a Wi-Fi password, they're um, listed on the side. Uh, one other additional note is if you have been here in the past two months, you might need to re-close um, down the the, pa the pass the username and start over because it's trying to use the previous password. Um, and before I introduce you to our esteemed moderator, we are quite fortunate to have the moderator that we are that we have today. I did just want to point out why we thought this event, and why we really um, were inspired to hear from Kiki and Kate and Jonathan about it, why we're doing this today, and that's because today's generation of young people is the largest in history. That's ne nearly half the world's population. So over or some three billion people are under the age of 25, and they have multiple sex sexual and reproductive health challenges, high rates of unintended pregnancy, HIV, and other sexually transmitted infections, maternal morbidity, and mortality. Young women, for example, ages 15 to 19, are twice as likely to die in childbirth as adults and are more likely to deliver low birth weight babies. Half of the new HIV infections occur in young people between the ages of 15 and 24. So their, their reproductive needs, their human rights are, are very critical right now. But in addition to all that, the really powerful economic and de development rationales for, for working to address their needs and health. Investing will yield large dividends for generations to come. 
So FP 2020 and the preventable maternal and child deaths and AIDS free generation are among the most important opportunities to work with and behalf of the largest generation of young people. So again, as I turn to our esteemed moderator, Jennifer Adams, the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Global Health at USAID, I do want to say to the today I'm looking forward to learning more about the pivotal role that youth play in these USAID strategic priorities and how young people's health and rights are critical to succeeding as a global community. So thank you. Turn that it's, on. It's, it's, it's on. So good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm Jennifer Adams from the Bureau uh, for Global Health uh, over at USAID, and I'm the moderator for this afternoon's very interesting panel. And I'd really like to thank Sandeep and thank the Wilson Center for giving us the opportunity to get together and talk about um, a really uh, important uh, and, of course, very timely uh, topic. I just was at the UN General Assembly, which is still taking place um, in New York, and I thought I would just share a few of the moments um, from the sessions, both formal and side event sessions that I participated in at UNGA um, that touched on, on, on this topic. Uh, and uh, some of you may have had the opportunity to see some of this because I think a number of those sessions were all also um, webcast. But there was a very interesting session uh, on Monday on the demographic dividend in the Sahel with um, presidents from uh, Niger, Chad, and Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, as well as um, U UNFPA uh, officials and, uh, and, and moderators from, um, from Al Jazeera. And it was very interesting to see the Sahelian presidents directly address um, the concerns that they have about a very young population uh, and a very um, a, a population very much uh, at risk of, of everything that Sadiq was just talking about, um, including particularly girls um, at risk of uh, early pregnancy and um, an early marriage. The president of Niger commented that it is not uncommon in his country to meet women who are 30 years old who are already grandmothers. So it was, um, it was, it was really, I think, uh, a, a, um, a very positive development to have had this session and to have had this discussion led by the presidents, particularly presidents that were speaking very frankly and addressing the, um, the reality that they face and that the women in their country face, and to begin to try to think of some uh, very uh, practical and um, implementable steps that could um, that could really address this. One such uh, step um, was adopted in uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, where recently, under the leadership of the president, they passed a law that actually um, sends to jail teachers in school who are responsible for. Um, for uh, pregnancy of their students, which apparently is quite a significant problem um, and a huge uh, disincentive for girls to go to school. Uh, and, uh, and it was under his leadership that the country began to turn the turn the paradigm a little bit from um, expelling the girls and not letting them come back to school um, if, they, if they became pregnant, to actually shifting some of the, uh, some of the responsibility onto um, the, the, the teachers who were the perpetrators, um, in some sense, of what is now, at least in the country of Cote d'Ivoire, um, officially a crime. So it was very interesting to see that uh, on, on the part of um, government officials and also on the side of um, the private sector, both civil society, NGOs, and um, the for-profit sector. There were a number of gatherings, including one this morning, which was hosted by JPIGO on exactly this topic. And it, um, it gave the opportunity for a, many different participants from a very wide cross-section of society to comment upon um, the problems associated with reproductive health uh, for uh, adolescents and young women in, in developing countries and to look at the interventions that are necessary to begin to address that problem, both those that are health specific and those that are, uh, are, are broader and address the needs of, um, of, of adolescents in a sense to give them their own voice and their own agency 
in 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 dealing with um, with with the situation and which and with these problems. So I was very encouraged and just wanted to share with you the fact that this was um, a topic that world leaders are um, stepping up to talk about, as well as very many um, concerned citizens, uh, both from this country and from uh, many other countries, under the auspices of the UN meeting. So, um, so our meeting today um, is is about investing in the sexual and reproductive health of youth. And I think um, primarily ac across the world, I think even in this country, there's a lot that could be done. But particularly, I think, um, given the panel members, um, what it is that we can do to assist youth in low and uh, middle income countries. And we already heard from Pradeep some of the quite. Um, quite arresting statistics um, about the size and scale of the issues that adolescents face in terms of their sexual and reproductive health. Um, the fact that half of the world's population is under 30 and there are uh, 1.8 billion people who are aged 10 to 24. Um, that uh, any development agenda would have to address their needs, including their health needs, um, as part of, uh, of, of, of accomplishing development goals. Um, and there's just a shockingly high percentage of youth that are at risk of early pregnancy, unsafe abortion, HIV, violence, and injury from violence. Um, so such that 2.6 million youth die every year, and the vast majority of them are from preventable causes. Um, girls, in particular, uh, have the the uh, increased risk of death uh, from early pregnancy. Um, 16 million girls aged 15 to 19 give birth, and 2 million girls under age 15 give birth. And those are the girls that we probably know the least about. We probably don't know those girls very well or have very much information to help us to figure out what's happening to them and what are the interventions both at the community and at a policy level um, that, could, that could address the situation um, that, that they find themselves in. Um, so it seems as though w what is it that we need to do? It seems like one thing that we need to do, and I think the panelists are going to speak specifically to some of what each organization is doing um, in, this, in this situation. It seems like one of the things that we need to do is listen to youth and find ways that we can listen um, to young people, uh, particularly uh, the young adolescent women uh, in low and uh, middle income countries who are at the highest risk. Um, it seems one thing that we need to do is to support research, to make sure that we understand exactly what is the problem and the issues and the context. Um, so I think that's something that USAID is starting to do and to begin to get some very interesting results which we can also talk about. And then I think we also need to engage all partners, both the traditional partners um, that we have as a development agency, our implementing organizations, other international organizations, other donors, but I think also new partners and particularly um, where possible those that are youth-led to begin to hear that voice and listen not only to their analysis of um, what the situation is and what the problems are, but also their suggestions of what some of the solutions might be. Um, so in USAID, we've been working for some time on a youth and development policy and trying to address the needs of adolescents and youth as a cross-cutting issue that, um, that really puts at the center uh, health, but also brings in really important components um, that are essential for addressing uh, the, the issue of, of youth and their development, like education, of course, but also um, employment and economic opportunity, uh, and even, I think, um, democracy and, um, and human rights. So we have been working on this uh, for some time, and it will uh, result in a number of new central projects um, and activities uh, that are youth-focused, um, including one that's under development called Youth Power and um, has resulted also in liaisons and partnerships with other donors, um, uh, some of which I know the panel will also speak to, um, that uh, allow us to participate with other, do other partners and other, other donors and other international organizations on, um, on, on these issues, each bringing what their specialized expertise is to try to create something that addresses adolescence as a whole person. 
So I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, and um, each of them, I think, is going to speak, uh, give some preliminary remarks. Some have um, uh, PowerPoints or slides. And then um, we'll have some questions uh, for the panel and then some interactive uh, questions from the audience. So um, our, first, uh, our first panelist is uh, Nina Henson who is the HIV uh, Prevention Technical Advisor um, at the Office of the Global AIDS Coordinator. And um, so at uh, OGAC, um, Nina works on both technical and programmatic issues, and she focuses a lot on um, HIV prevention and gender issues in Southern Africa. Hold on, we have to adjust for the very short. <laughs> Thanks, Jennifer. You know, I realized I sent in the ultra short version of my biography, <laughs> but I promise I did something between graduating from college and coming to work <laughs> at OGAC. You'll find out later. Um, and I want to, before I launch in, I just want to thank both the Woodrow Wilson Center and the coalition for putting this event together. You know, my role here is that I work on HIV prevention, but um, starting when I was in college, uh, you know, adolescent and sexual reproductive health and rights was a big focus for me, partly because I was one. Um, and partly because I've really cared about this issue for a long time. And I think it's so important that we continue to talk about it. We've made tremendous progress. And in, at the same time, we have really not come n nearly as far as we need to, um, partly because of these issues about how quickly this population, this segment of the population is growing. And so it really requires that we continue to have a laser-like focus on what we're doing for young people and to ensure that their health and rights are, are protected as they move into adulthood. So with that, um, I was asked to discuss why young people are important to me and the goals of an AIDS-free generation. And I'm going to spend some time doing that, but I know that I'm preaching to the choir because all of us know that young people are important. But I think what you want to hear is how PEPFAR sees that important, so I'll spend some time on that. And then I'm going to spend some time talking about sort of what we've been doing for the last few years, and I'll wrap up a bit with our vision going forward. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to do justice to everything that PEPFAR is doing. It's a very decentralized program in a lot of ways, so country programs are doing a tremendous amount of work that they try to communicate to us in these incredibly awkward um, documents called country operational plans that don't capture very well exactly what's going on. So I, I'm sure that, you know, there's a gazillion programs that I should be mentioning that I won't, but I want to give you broad brushstroke feeling of what's going on. And then in the conversation later, we can get into some more depth about what we are and aren't managing to do here. So in 2012, at a, um, at a speech in the lead up to World AIDS Day, then Secretary Clinton announced a new sort of ambitious goal, which was the achievement of an AIDS-free generation. Um, and this was really made possible by remarkable advances, both in our ability to deliver certain kinds of interventions and the impact that we were seeing those interventions have. And we began to realize that we could look to a future where we virtually eliminated perinatal infection with HIV. That was something we could begin to get our hands around. We could look at rapid declines in HIV incidence. We are starting to see that in some places. And most importantly, we could see a world in which HIV did not lead to AIDS, right? People would, be conti would continue to be infected, but nobody would ever go on to have AIDS, to die from HIV. And that was, that's the vision of an AIDS-free generation. And that, that vision was documented in the PEPFAR blueprint, which I'm sure lots of you have read, cover to cover, memorized. <laughs> and it has lots of content in it about young people. So there's lots of talk about prevention for young people, tailored programs, um, working with parents and guardians, increasing access to care and treatment, and global, ab global advocacy. And one of the important pieces about the blueprint is it sort of lays out where PEPFAR is going to head, but it does so with the understanding that we're heading there with our partners. We can't achieve an AIDS-free generation just with PEPFAR dollars. We, and even if we had all the money in the world, it wouldn't work if we didn't really have partner governments and other stakeholders that were going there with us because it requires policy and advocacy, requires political will, all kinds of things that a donor can't provide. So the blueprint is sort of our vision of where we'd like everybody to go marching together. And then in the spring, we got a brand new global AIDS coordinator, 
Dr. Deborah Burks, and I'm sure that you've been, some of you hearing her speeches and listening to um, what she has to say. And for her, young people have also been a big priority, and we'll see especially this population of young females, 15 to 24. And so as she focuses on the blueprint and on reaching her goal of epidemic control, so in other words, one of the critical goals of getting to an AIDS-free generation is we have to get the epidemic under control, recognizing how important young people are there. So let's turn to that. Okay, so uh, uh, rhetorical question. Why should young people be a focus of the HIV response? Actually, a couple of years ago, this wasn't a rhetorical question. I don't know if you can really read these slides, but you can see that in 2010, there's a whole group that's dedicated to the analysis of trends in HIV prevalence and behaviors in young people in countries most affected by HIV. That's their title. And every few years, they generate these reports which look at trends. And these little short lines here are the trends in 15 to 24-year-olds. You can see they went down in South Africa. They're going down in Zimbabwe. They're going down in Tanzania. The boys are kind of plateaued in Botswana, but very low, and the girls are going down. And so, you know, when we started kind of advocating for this at OGAC, I had people say to me, like, where, where's the problem? You know, actually, things are going well. Don't make a problem where there isn't a problem. Well, this is the problem, right? The problem is that even where prevalence is very low in young people, they make up such a large proportion of the population in the countries where we work mm -hmm. that the absolute number of new infections that's happening in young people is enormous. And we're not finding most of them because they're horizontally infected young women and some young men who feel well, right? And so, this is a tremendous problem in terms of stopping onward transmission and also in terms of reaching young people whose lives will be vastly improved if they're in care and treatment early when they're infected and whose infections we should be able to prevent, right, if we can do a better job with the tools we have and with developing some new ones. So just here's a little example, and I actually put this uh, graph together for the COP review this year when we were looking at Uganda. So the, um, this line here is the line of prevalence. And you can see that prevalence sort of peaks for both males and females at 35 to 39. But these bars represent absolute numbers of PLHIV. That peak is younger, right? And it starts growing here in the 20 to 24 year olds. So if we really want to be successful at epidemic control, especially in the countries with large generalized epidemics, we're really going to have to get a handle on the sort of 15 to 24-year-olds in order to make sure that those people are getting the best care possible if they are infected and that we're beginning, we're getting much better preventing infections there. It's not that we haven't been successful at all as those graphs depict, but we have to get much more successful because of the number of young people that we're talking about. So uh, Dr. Burks presents this slide every time she does a talk. This is UNAIDS data, um, and it, it basically shows the tremendous disparities between young women, and, young women and men in generalized epidemics with HIV prevalence. In some cases, young women are three times as prevalent with HIV as men. And this is, you know, people have said, oh, it's just because of the gap in age, you know, young women have sex with older men. Some data is actually starting to suggest that isn't true. I don't think, you know, there's a ton of hypotheses out there about why young women are so overrepresented in the population of living, people living with HIV. I think we don't actually know the answer. But what we do know is we have to get better at doing something about it real quick. The, many of these women are obviously having unprotected sex. They're going on to have children. They're at risk of transmitting HIV to their children, and their own health and well-being is really compromised. In fact, HIV is the leading cause of death among adolescent girls in sub-Saharan Africa, which is shocking. Because when you think that most of these girls are being infected horizontally, they should be young and healthy. HIV shouldn't be killing them in the first few years that they're infected, but it is. So that suggests that there's real health issues there that we're not getting at. This isn't just a question of finding people when they're young because it looks good. We're really talking about an important risk of death in this population. So there's a sense of urgency here that we need to get a better handle on. Oops, there's a connection problem. Anyone want to solve that? Okay. So I apologize for this super busy slide. I really wanted to have a slide about key populations because we know from qualitative data that most people who um, inject drugs, young, most um, people who have se men who have sex with men, uh, most people who engage in sex work start these behaviors young. And so I really wanted to show that in, you know, a developing context. And it was really hard to actually find data. So this is data from the United States. And what basically this is showing is that um, this is a 
true over the years, but if you look at 2009, among black African Americans or African Americans who are infected with HIV, this is MSM, the vast majority of new infections came from 13 to 29 year olds. Ditto in Latinos, not as big a difference, but still important. Uh, and then this is um, young white men who don't, who don't overrepresent qu to quite the same extent, but are still a substantial proportion. And so overall, we're looking, oops, that box should be there, at uh, about 13,000 new infections contributed in 2009 by 13 to 29 year old MSM. And that is, tends to be true all over the world. So unless our programs are really targeting young key populations, our key populations programs, we're probably <laughs> not really where we need to be. And again, those populations tend to be the most stigmatized and the most hidden, and it's the hardest to reach them with effective programs, and we just have to figure that out. The same is true of young injecting drug users. So um, data from UNICEF, UNAIDS, and WHO suggest that um, seven out of every 10 injecting drug users in Russia, Central Asia, Eastern Europe um, are under the age of 25. But I have to tell you, I mean, we've been working on this, but if you go to programs for injecting drug users in those countries, the majority of people in the like needle ex and syringe exchange programs, the MAT programs are much older than that. Yeah, so we haven't fig really figured out this problem. People are working on it. I don't want to undermine people's efforts. This will be when someone comes up later and tells me about a program, PEPFAR's funding, that's working with young people. That's okay. I'd like to be wrong. So, um, and so just a little data on uh, kind of where there's some gaps are. So this is, uh, this is not the greatest graph, but basically on the left is the proportion of young females and males. This is uh, females 15 to 19. Sorry, that's wrong. Males 15 to 19, females 20 to 24. This is um, correct, and this is comprehensive knowledge of HIV. And you can just basically see in some countries like Mozambique and Zambia, Lesotho, where prevalence is really high, you know, the, the knowledge is below 50%. And when you think that we've been working with these populations for some years, it's pretty disappointing that we're not getting a better uh, sample there. You know, things aren't looking better. And then really importantly, there's still this huge gap in treatment and pediatric treatment. Now this, this number is zero to 15. So I don't, this, uh, which illustrates another problem I'll talk about in a minute. But when we look at the rates of adults, which is the blue bars, compared to the rates of children, which is the green bars, we can see that everywhere but Botswana, we are not doing a very good job of enrolling young people who are positive in treatment. There's a big, big gap. And there's lots of reasons for that, but we can't allow that to go on. Because young people, when they go untreated, develop really serious morbidities that can plague them for the rest of their lives. We need to do a better job of ensuring that we're both bringing down the number of young people who are infected and the ones who are infected, we are finding them and enrolling them in treatment and treating them successfully and retaining them. Okay, so that's the bad news. So let's talk about what we are doing right now, what we've been doing in the last few years. So I'm gonna start with the clinical piece. So there's a lo been a lot of attention in the last few years to the gaps in clinical care and PEPFAR programs. And so what we started with was kind of what are the programmatic needs? How do we begin to look at doing a better job? And one of the first things that we did with um, Aid Star One, USAID funded this, was to build a toolkit for, I'm sorry about the poor quality here, the toolkit uh, for transition of care for adolescents living with HIV. So there's a whole, um, cohort of children that were initiated on treatment, you know, after they were born infected, and they've been with us for some years, and it's time for them to move from pediatric care into adult care, and we have a tremendous drop-off. Mm -hmm. And that's true in Africa. It's also true in the United States. It's true all over the world. It's just very challenging to transition adolescence because <laughs> adolescence is a challenging time. But we, we need to get good at it. We are figuring some things out. And this toolkit was designed to sort of pull together that information and especially to make it relevant in a low-resource setting. The other thing we started noticing as we began to scale up programs to address the um, needs of survivors of sexual assault, especially the HIV prevention needs, but not exclusively, is that the vast number of patients who were showing up in those programs were children. And we had no information for providers on how to deal with children who'd been sexually assaulted. All the guidelines, everything out there was for adults. And so, you know, we kind of scratched our head for a while. It's not exactly our role, but we decided that in the absence of anything better, we would put forward some technical considerations, which are actually really great. And they're designed to be very sort of hands-on and practical, how a provider who's confronted with a child who's been assaulted, um, sexually assaulted, can provide 
uh, quality care. And while we're at it, we'll just point out that in the past four years, PEPFAR has reached 114,000 people with post-exposure prophylaxis. And as I mentioned, the majority of people who present for that are children. So we are beginning to touch these issues around gender-based violence and HIV. We have a long way to go. Okay, so let's talk about prevention and what PEPFAR has been doing. Actually, from its inception, PEPFAR was really focused on preventing, preventing new HIV infections among young people. And, you know, you all know, or most of you probably know, that the early years of PEPFAR was very politicized around prevention and what we could do and couldn't do. And a lot of that is painted with a pretty broadly negative brushstroke, but there were some really good programs that were started under PEPFAR-1 for young people, and one of the ways that we can see that is when you look at prevalence, especially in South Africa, in 15 to 19-year-olds, sort of dropped from 2006 kind of until now on a sort of regular basis, and that probably had something to do with the blasting of messages around protecting yourself from HIV. Um, so we have uh, programs like Shuga, which is like a, a mass media program. It started in Kenya. It's a TV show. There's a radio show. Now there's a game. It um, has very appealing characters and HIV and protecting yourself from HIV is interwoven into the storylines. We have um, small groups like this one in Cote d'Ivoire for young people. Um, we have education programs. And those programs have actually really matured and developed over the um, history of PEPFAR. And then uh, we've also added voluntary medical male circumstances to our toolkit. It's very effective at preventing HIV infections. It's about 60% effective, and in some cases, some studies suggest more. So it's, we're looking at vaccine level protection um, for men. And as the percentage of males who are circumcised grows over time, the knock-on preventative effects for women will be tremendous. It's going to take us a while to get there. Thanks. Uh, and interesting to note that of the 4.7 million male circumcisions that PEPFAR has supported since 2008, the vast majority of them are in under 30-year-olds. We didn't start age disaggregating that data until this year, and so I can't tell you exactly how many, but a lot, most. I can say that. That's what I was told I could say, a lot, almost all of them. Okay. And then, you know, until recently... We've been struggling with this big, like, stove piping within PEFAR, you know, that term, where we have, like, the OVC stuff over here and the prevention over here and the clinical over here, and we're trying to bring them together. But where data is really starting to suggest that the work that we've been doing on the OVC platform for years around social protection, which is basically making sure that you know, children affected by HIV have enough food to eat and a chance to go to school and resources um, to you know, build skills and go into trades and stuff like that, that that actually has a significant impact on risk behaviors associated with HIV. So this is Lucy Kluver's work in South Africa. She's actually looking at the impact of the social protection grants that the South African government provides. And uh, what you see on the, the tall bars are the girls who didn't get a grant and the short bars are the girls who did. And this is um, Incidence of transactional sex, which we know is a big risk factor for HIV in South Africa. And what you can see is that when you, ha when you get, you know, enough food to eat and some help to go to school, you're much less likely to engage in transactional sex. And this population of girls who are affected by HIV because a parent has been infected are at substantially greater risk of acquiring HIV. So ensuring that these girls don't engage in transactional sex is critical to reduce the number of new infections in this population we just identified as being a major source of new infections. Okay, and then the last thing that, we, that I'll talk about that we've been focusing on in the, in the last couple of years is around improving data. So one of the big issues that we saw on that uh, treatment gap slide is that the way that we've been looking at data since the beginning of PEPFAR is 0 through 14 and 15 to 49. And it's very, very hard to figure out what's going on with young people when you only have data in those two categories. So we've been waging this campaign both globally at the UN and in our own country programs to go to five-year age bands. This is a huge lift. It's a tremendous amount of work for country programs, but we must do it. If we don't know what's happening 10 to 14, 15 to 19, 20 to 24, we're not really going to understand whether or not we're breaking the back of the epidemic in this population. So we've really invested a lot here, and we need to continue to do so. Um, we are also disaggregating by sex and age together so we can look at young women and young men separately. That's very important and a lot of work. Uh, we're building new quality standards. We have a whole new system uh, to do 
uh, rapid assessments of quality of the services we provide, and we're looking at standards related specifically to young people in that assessment system. I can answer questions about that if you want. It's pretty new and beta, so I didn't want to show anything. Uh, and then we're also working with partner governments to improve their data so they can think about this question. Here's another example from Uganda where they did, we, PEFAR supported the government to do a retrospective analysis, so they did a sampling of clinics around the country, and they just looked at data specifically in 10 to 19-year-olds. And so here's an example of the kind of analysis they were able to do. These are all the, uh, the 10 to 19-year-olds who they found positive out of their sample. And so there's about 3,000 of them were positive. And then uh, this is, um, so this is the males who are positive, this is the females, and this is the linkage, right? So many more females are positive, but they were doing a much better job getting linked to services than those boys. So this is the kind of program data that country governments can use to assess whether or not their, the services they're providing are actually meeting the needs of the population. Of course, what's missing here is a denominator, right? So what we don't have good data on that we really need is how many adolescents are we talking about? You know, what percentage of all the infections in the area is this? 711, so that we know where's the gap between the boys that actually came and got tested and the boys we never even touched. Okay, so looking ahead really quickly, uh, big news this summer was the announcement of ACT, the um, Accelerating Children's HIV AIDS Treatment Initiative out of PEPFAR. This is a big chunk of change, $250 million, $200 million to double the number of children in antiretroviral, on antiretroviral care uh, in the next two years. It's actually a five-year partnership to do that. And this should have a tremendous impact on the number of young people who are accessing treatment. This is zero to 19, so it's not just focused on the population that we're interested in, but we will, through ACT, be looking at increasing the numbers of 10 to 19-year-olds who are able to access treatment. I'm just hurrying because I'm running out of time. Addressing the prevention gap, WHO just launched, or is about to launch, I can't quite get a handle on that, these really cool policy briefs on young key populations, and we'll be working to bring those out to our programs in the field and try to get some traction on that issue. And then the other thing, I just want you to keep your eye on this space. We're looking very carefully at this issue of young women and HIV and trying to look at where we can make the programs that we have right now more effective, how to focus them more tightly on that population geographically and age-wise and getting better are in there. There'll be more coming on this in the near future, but I can't talk about it now. Okay, and just really looking forward, this is work funded um, by PEPFAR through USAID largely, but not entirely on microbicides. But the big news here is that in 2005, we're going to have results from three studies, two ring studies, Aspire and the ring study, which will tell us whether or not the dipiropine ring, that's a, that's a ring you can insert in the vagina that has uh, antiretroviral medication in it, is effective at preventing HIV. And if the answer is yes, that will be a tremendous tool for us. It's the, it'll, it'll really be, sorry to use a cliche, a game changer. FAX001 is also important, though. It's the follow-on study on tenofovir gel. So if we can show some other better ways to make tenofovir gel work as an HIV prevention tool for women, even though it won't be as convenient as a ring, we may be able to get it to market sooner, and that will be another really important tool. So I'll just say thank you. These are folks I work with at PEPFAR um, and also the Global AIDS Coordinator and also at USAID. And I thank Annie Shapiro, who did a ton of work to help me pull this talk together. But really, I just want to thank the thousands and thousands of people who work with us to try to reach this population. There's our implementing partners, there's our government partners, there's volunteers and community workers, people who are tremendously dedicated. It's a privilege to work with them and a privilege to talk to you about them today. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. That was really a uh, great presentation, very interesting, lots of information. Um, so now we will turn to um, uh, Dr. Catherine Bongabai from the uh, International Youth Alliance uh, on Family Planning, uh, where she's the public affairs officer. And um, Dr. Bai is also a medical doctor and a public health graduate of Hopkins, originally from, um, from Cameroon and uh, now working for the International Youth Alliance. Hey, hi everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Catherine, and I'll be talking about the youth perspective with regards to the promise renewed, that is ending preventable child and maternal deaths. And uh, generally, I'm going to be giving the youth voice. 
So I don't have a very long CV, but all of it is shaped by the burden that I have about youth sexual and reproductive health. So in 2010, the Global Strategy for Women's and Children's Health was launched by the UN Secretary General, which stresses the importance of addressing the health and welfare of adolescent girls in order to achieve the fifth millennium development goal. So that's like the importance and relevance of you. And the, in 2012 in DC, here in DC, the government of Ethiopia and India and the United States together with UNICEF mobilized the world to achieve the following goals aimed at preventing uh, preventable maternal and child deaths. So acting on this call, the USAID has been able to do a lot already. And in 2014, they released the USAID 2020 Maternal Vision for Action Notes. And these are the primary components which were included that's um, enabling and mobilizing individuals and communities, advancing quality respectful care, and strengthening health systems and continuous learning. So I'm going to give some statistics which are going to focus a little bit on adolescent figures. So we see here that about 16 million adolescent girls give birth every year, mostly in low and middle income countries. And an estimated 3 million girls aged 15 to 19 undergo unsafe abortions every year. And adolescent pregnancy is a major contributor to maternal and child mortality. So these figures are really disturbing. And I realize that many organizations at different levels have given different input and point of uh, interventions, including the USAID. But we cannot talk about reducing maternal and child mortality without addressing unintended pregnancies and family planning. So what have youth got to do with it? So like Sandip said, Youth are the largest population, that's the youth now are the largest population of youth in history ever. And youth are the center of it all. They're directly implicated by our policies and programming. And why am I interested in all this? Like, I'm really passionate about all this because I'm 25 years old, so I'm a youth. And I'm a physician from Cameroon. And I intend to work in this field for my entire life. So I generated, I generated this little graph based on experiences that I had. So I worked at, um, at a clinic uh, on the outskirts of Yaoundé, and I realized that a lot of young girls came to consult because they were pregnant, and they needed to know what to do. Well, they wanted to abort the babies, and there was really nothing I could do about it because abortion is illegal in Cameroon. So you talk to them, convince them to keep the baby and everything, and they walk out of your office, and you're like, oh, well. So it happened a lot of times, but what is most striking is these girls came back. So they came back psychologically traumatized. They came back with bleeding or low abdominal pain. In fact, they've tried to commit an abortion themselves. So they came back, and I'm obliged to help them with a vacuum aspiration. But if you think about the cost that they had to go through, and if you think about the trauma, the infection some of them already had, the complications, the fact that they were, they were, they were like you know affecting their future fertility and all that. So based on based on all that, I started wondering about policies and like why are policies really made, like. Um, when I finished med school, I wanted to do like cardiology, something super important, according to me. But after my experiences, if you ask me at that time when I was working, what I wanted to do, all I said was I want to study policy making. Well, I didn't know what it was, so that led me to a lot of studies and a lot of researches, and I tried to find everything I could, and I ended up as a graduate student. <laughs> and so nobody understands why I would finish med school for seven years in Cameroon, seven years, and go to grad school, but I really needed to do something. So I made some assumptions after what happened, like, well, my, after my experience, I was like, maybe the young girls in that region are particularly promiscuous, or maybe I'm exaggerating because I'm young and female. So I realized that I worked as a pharmacy consultant, like elsewhere, and I had the same thing, girls coming to ask for a drug to help them abort or something, and there's nothing you can do. So really, it's not about the girls in that region. And another thing is, I realized that the girls did come to the clinic because there was a young female doctor there and expected somebody to understand with them and to feel what they're feeling. So true, I wasn't exaggerating because I was young and female, but maybe I got the experience particularly because of that. So well, from then I decided to focus on youth and family planning and sexual and reproductive health and rights. 
And you know, there are actually certain realities directly linked to reducing maternal and child mortality, like uh, directly linked to, uh, for youth, like um, access to safe abortion, comprehensive sexual and reproductive health education, and youth sexual rights. So I wanna talk about meaningful engagement. So what does real meaningful engagement look like? That's like a question out to the crowd. Like, what does engagement look like? So I believe that youth should be key pillars in addressing the prevention of child and maternal death, which we have all agreed upon already. But I'm going to give the youth, like what youth think about the fact that youth should be key pillars. So youth are no longer just victims. Besides being the greatest proportion of the population, it's normal to say that we are a population in need because all these things concern us and you know, we're like on the limelight, but the solution is within us as well. So you have the solution for this as well. So um, just, I'm just gonna highlight generally some, um, some events which show that youth are actually interested in what's happening to them. So in 2013, there was an international youth conference, um, sorry, the International Conference on Family Planning. I say international youth conference because there were so many youth <laughs> there. So we had 350 youth, which was amazing for the pre-conference and conference. Like I was totally amazed because I fell upon, let me put it this way, I fell upon the conference because I was just on my, on my, on the internet searching and then I see this opportunity to attend a conference and I just dive in and so I was really amazed that every other person surely did that. So after the International Conference on Family Planning, we had the International Youth Alliance on Family Planning, which was a, a born, as I can say, which is a youth-led organization. And what I want to highlight about this organization is that from that time to date, we have more than 400 member requests from youth in different countries. And we have 50 country, we have 50 countries that are represented in the organization, which according to me is huge because, you know, not only are we, do we realize that we have a problem, but we are willing to do something about it. So what can youth do? At some point, and even now, a lot of people, we all are worried about the problems that youth are facing. And it's like youth seem oblivious of what's happening around, but a lot has changed since. And youth around the world are actually trying to do something. So I'm gonna showcase some youth activity, involvement, capacities around the world, just some examples to show that, you know, we're ready to work. Like, just let us work with you. So this is Oko in Ghana. So Oko is a youth ambassador for a reproductive health program in Ghana, which they call No Yawa, which means no problem. And under this program, he trains peer educators and counselors around, uh, across Ghana. He leads social media campaigns. These first two are like adverts for youth. And on the radio and TV, he educates listeners and viewers on issues relating to sexual and reproductive health and rights, reflecting on global and national documents. And he also refers young people to services, including counseling. I like to note that all the people I'm gonna show are below 24 years old. Okay, here you have Adebisi in Nigeria. Adebisi in Nigeria is like, the, he's the National Technical Working, he's a member of the National Technical Working Group on Adolescent Health and Development, which involves development of a national training manual on peer-to-peer -peer education. And he's a key person in the Growing Girls and Women in Nigeria, which is a program aimed at training 4,800 adolescent girls across 12 states in the country. So here is Amanda in Uganda, and she's part of the Coalition on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, and here they are delivering sexual and reproductive health services during the National Youth Festival in Kampala. This is Sri Lanka, this is Dakshita in Sri Lanka, who with other youth are making a sexual or productive health and rights glossary in sign language because they identified that this was a barrier for young people with hearing disabilities. So he's also involved in the formulation of national young people's health policy and he's one of the youth uh, in the development of the Lancet Commission on Adults and Health and Wellbeing. So this is Jerome in Liberia, sorry. So Jerome is working with a youth-funded uh, local-based organization in Liberia, e educating young people about sexual and reproductive health. They use SMS, workshops, debates, and door-to-door -door campaigns. So after all this, what can youth do? 
So besides being a good proportion of the world's population, we are the most internet and tech savvy. So from studies to research, programs and goals, the importance of technology cannot be sidelined. The social media coverage statistics on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, they are all proof that to a given extent, youth have what it takes. So simply put, youth know what youth need. So it's exciting and refreshing to me in particular to notice a global interest in investing in youth and paying attention to our needs and problems. But there's a but. It's time for policymakers and organizations to say let's come and reason together, like let's work together. Let's sit down together and find solutions and implement solutions. So to conclude, you're making a mistake if you don't involve youth in all sexual and reproductive health and rights programming, interventions, implementations. So we need to work together. That's it. Thank you, Catherine, very much. Um, now, uh, we've gone from having very short bios to having no bios, <laughs> but um, Alyssa Cameron, who is our next speaker, um, uh, is um, the Deputy Director of the Office of Population and Reproductive Health uh, at USAID. Uh, she's a Foreign Service Officer who has served um, in a number of key posts, most recently in Tanzania, and she's going to talk a little bit about um, youth and family planning. Kind of fun and exciting to be the mystery speaker, except for the <laughs> fact that I think I know probably a, a, a good amount of you. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity today to come and speak. Um, and I would like to today take an opportunity to do a crosswalk and crosswalk um, uh, USAID with Family Planning 2020 and uh, our focus on youth. Uh, before I jump into the presentation, and we're talking a lot about the hows and the why of youth, um, and I fully admit up front, this is not uh, our uh, graphic, but the 2050 and the 1950 graphic, I believe this is PRB, uh, Kate, I think is right, yes. Hello, thank you. I actually was really struck by this when I saw this for the first time, and I thought about it a little bit, and I was trying to figure out why, because it, it, it's a very simple graphic, but to me, if I drew a line in the middle, and I'm thinking I'm holding a mirror in my hand, or I'm in a, this is a fun analogy for a not fun graphic, in a carnival fun house, your, what we're seeing is a reflection that's distorted. But in effect, it's not a reflection. This potentially is our reality. And so I think about this when I'm standing in front of the mirror this morning getting dressed, about what it would mean and how can we help to move that mirror to a more upright position and why it really matters, which I think is what we're really doing here today. So as part of this crosswalk, just to start, USAID's commitment to adolescent and youth and sexual reproductive health is reflected in the agency's global health priorities, um, which we've heard about here today a little bit already, ending preventable maternal and child death and creating an AIDS-free generation. Um, and as Jennifer uh, mentioned at the beginning of the session today, uh, meeting the health needs of adolescents is a critical component of USAID's development agenda um, to extre end extreme poverty and overall part of our health agenda, um, including these uh, very important initiatives, and then in particular we'll be talking about FP 2020 today. We've heard a lot of the reasons why, um, and to add to that, there's about 15 million teen girls that give birth every year. Uh, in low-income countries, we know that childbirth is dangerous enough, but can you imagine being one of those teenagers in those developing countries, the higher risk that she'll be facing? When a young woman gives uh, birth uh, or is pregnant and gives birth before 18, she faces a 28 higher risk of maternal mortality than one who is even a few years younger. We also know the impact on nutrition. We know the impact on the community and the family as well. So obviously increasing access to family planning information, um, as we just heard from my colleague in talking about what it means and why the girls are coming in that early. So increasing the access to this information and services to adolescents will help dis 
delay that pregnancy, which would benefit both the, the baby and mother, obviously. Addressing the needs of a large youth population is our new reality in global health. Keeping that in mind, this is not a distortion. Currently, this is a reality, unless we do things together and we do things differently together. So I want to start at a more macro level, and I want to talk about global leadership, and others have referenced this as well. Family planning receives support from both foreign and domestic leaders. It really does. President Obama has been very vocal about his support. You can read that here for family planning, and so is David Cameron, the former Secretary, <coughs> David Cameron, the former Secretary of State, as many of you know, Hillary Clinton, was an outspoken advocate of women and girls and of family planning programs. Um, and as Jennifer just mentioned, it's very exciting to hear some of our African presidents, our African leaders as well, um, talking about it in a more direct, um, and clear manner, which is, I think, um, some really great progress. Speeches and the support from the politicians and the policymakers raises awareness about the need for family planning, but to make tangible gains to really make a difference on the ground, we also need financial support as well as program plans and a high level of global coordination. So Family Planning 2020 is just this type of global partnership that supports and promotes the rights of women and girls to decide freely and for themselves whether and when and how many children they want to have. Family Planning 2020 is also building a lot on the work that's already been done. So just to point out that this isn't something that came in with Cape Flying, ta-da, here we are, that nobody's been thinking about and dedicating their life to already. Um, but it is really building on these previous commitments as well as actives, taking advantage of this active support from policymakers. And all of these partners' will, work will be criti critical to making this initiative work. So moving from global, from the macro level, down a level, talking about international and U.S. government goals and indicators for family planning. Um, so Family Planning 2020's goal is to reach 120 million more women and girls with access to voluntary family planning, information, contraceptives, and services by 2020. And so we can see the progression from the Millennium Development Goals, uh, four, five, and six in the light of AIDS free generation as well. And then equally the US government was engaged in the Global Health Initiative which set out targets and indicators, well not targets, let me take that back when I'm mentioning family planning and targets, I didn't say that <laughs> at all. <laughs> delete, 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 rewind. <laughs> but for uh, the Global Health we're talking about similar goals and aspirations, preventing 122 million unintended pregnancies, increase, increasing contraceptive prevalence, and reduce the number of women with first pregnancies before age 18. So this has been on the radar for a while. Family, family Planning 2020 goals brings us all together. And again, supporting the right of 120 million additional women and to use family planning success to drive future momentum for the broader uh, reproductive maternal newborn child health continuum of care. So this is a bit of a, a text-dense slide, um, but it will give you an idea of USAID's partnership across the spectrum for family planning and reproductive health. I'm not going to go over all of this, but you can see that we're not working in a vacuum and how important partnerships are to us and how, um, how we can move them forward. So the types of partnerships really range from a strategic partnership with a global vision to technical leadership where we're having joint efforts for commodity security or um, looking at uh, high impact family planning best practices. So that gives a snapshot a little bit of our, our partnerships across the board. And again, so now specifically to talk about family planning 2020. So the vision is women and girls should have the same access to life-saving contraceptives and services no matter where they live. And the goals, I think, that we've already talked about this, but just to highlight that vision. So there's quite a few countries that are, have made or are making commitments to Family Planning 2020. 
And I'll talk a little bit in a minute specifically about USAID and USAID support. But countries themselves, so this is not led just by donors, but it's also by the countries themselves. And they've made tangible commitments. Um, so I can think of examples in Senegal, in India, Uganda, and the Philippines, where they have commitments that they've made publicly as part of this, talking about line item budgets, or if they're already putting money towards contraceptives, increasing the amounts in those line item budgets. There's policy commitments that are equally as important as financial commitments. There's commitments that talk about scaling up insurance, which we know is, uh, is part of the financing platform that can really move um, and increase access. There's also commitments of scale up of training or scale up of services. So countries themselves are active partners in this, and I think this will be one of the things that helps um, really uh, drive the success of Family Planning 2020's vision. So USAID is in a majority of these countries where you see the flags as well as um, the additional ones um, in supporting the goals of FP 2020. And um, we're really helping these countries and um, these partners in these countries to deliver on results leading up to the attainment of the goals. And a lot of this has an emphasis on youth. So specifically, we're partnering with government and other donors um, to commit time, energy, resource, technical assistance, and creative solutions, and I will say hopefully and the youth together, <laughs> um, to uh, really um, help the improve access and availability for use in adolescents um, for uh, sexual and reproductive health. So three examples that I can share is with support from USAID, Tanzania is one example, and I can speak easily from about that one, being just there, um, helped develop um, as a group, as a collective, uh, costed implementation plan. And it had some very uh, ambitious targets um, of 60% for use of modern uh, family planning methods. Um, and realized that the goal would be impossible without uh, meeting the high unmet need of uh, adolescents and youth in particular. Um, so this is one way that collectively we're really helping to, to drive this agenda. I'll submit with support from USAID, the government of Burkina Faso in partnership with Pathfinder um, has introduced youth-friendly services and health facilities in two areas, um, and then really looking at scaling programs to serve young married women and their partners. Um, equally, USAID in Mozambique, and I'll just touch upon this so I don't um, steal your thunder for your presentation, as well um, works with the youth programming as well. So again, it's a combination of effort, of time, of resources, and a lot of this really is focused on the youth. So Jennifer touched on this earlier um, and talking about USAID's policy on youth and development, um, and this was in 2012, and I'll let you read the slide. Um, but really, this is, we did this in recognition of the critical role of youth in the present and the future of all nations. And again, I think of the bulge in the beginning of the slide. We're looking at the present and we're also talking about the future. And in this case, we have to talk about them in the same breath. So we've worked uh, consciously to raise up further the emphasis and engagement with youth. So again, 2012, we did the, developed the youth and uh, development policy to guide our work with young people. And as Jennifer mentioned, the youth and development policy helps us mainstream youth health programs into our development goals by working across multiple <laughs> sectors that influence youth behaviors and health. So this includes taking successful interventions to scale, such as youth-friendly health services or life course approaches to health care, as well as holistic and integrated programs. One easy one that you can think about when you're trying to put this into sort of a real context is often we hear about the links between education and family planning and sexual reproductive health. So frequently you will see that um, tied together in country programs. 
So our goals also include preventing early marriage and early pregnancy. I don't think we've talked a lot about that today, but I'm sure as most of you are aware, it's a priority for the agency. I think it's a priority for a lot of us. And really promoting positive gender norms and behavior, ensuring youth have access to age and developmentally appropriate reproductive and sexual health information and services, including a range of contraceptive methods, and building community support for adolescent health. And all of this aligns with the goals and vision of Family Planning 2020. Youth and adolescents are key to achieving the Family Planning 2020 goals. If we're not reaching the largest generation in history with family planning information and services, <clears throat> these young people, especially young women and girls, will not have the tools with which they need to make informed reproductive health decisions. The devastating health and social effects of early pregnancy contribute to the cycles of poor health and poverty that's been established. When we enable girls and young women to delay their first pregnancy through voluntary family planning programs, they can stay in school longer, join the workforce, and raise a healthier family. Of the 28 countries involved in FP 2020, again, 16 have committed to expanding outreach of services for youth. So it really is happening, and the commitments are there. And the performance monitoring and accountability framework from FP 2020 includes an indicator specifically related to adolescence and the adolescence fertility rate. We also should take a moment to think about youth and family planning sexual reproductive health and what it means for the demographic dividend as well. So we have to tailor our approach to adolescents and youth and reproductive sexual health to reflect the needs of this ever-growing population. And USAID is advocating for cross-sectoral approaches to adolescent health that promote youth engagement in the development agenda. And others, I think, have probably presented this slide equally. But it really talks about the, all of the elements that have to come together to be able to take advantage of the demographic dividend. So in many of the countries where we work, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, youth between the age of 10 and 24 make up more than a third, and sometimes as much as 50%. I'm thinking of the youth grids that were shown during your presentation. Um, so they can make up as high as 50% of the population. Um, many of these youth have already entered their reproductive years, as we saw about also some of the data. Um, and others may be on the cusp of starting down that path. And an estimated 90 million people between the ages of 15 and 19 are on their way to becoming, hopefully becoming, financially independent as they enter adulthood. And as we're all aware, these people represent opportunities. They represent a great economic and social potential to their countries, but only if families and governments adequately invest in the health and education of young people and stimulate new economic opportunities for them. And so here, let's see if I can work the pointer. We're talking about there has to be investments in education, in health, in government, and economics to go along with the gears of the population structure to be able to drive this demographic dividend. And the de demographic dividend is not a guarantee. It isn't do this, get that. It's an opportunity. It's a window where if these things happen and you have this mix, you can take advantage of the demographic dividend, which will drive poverty reduction in these nations. In these nations, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, and a distinguishing common feature today is that the working age of the population is between those between 15 and 64 is much larger than the dependent population, the very young and old. And this phenomenon is really the demographic dividend is rooted in decisions that were made in the 60s and 70s to improve child survival. So we also have an increasing um, uh, life, age life. Drew a blank on that one. Name it. Expectancy. Thank you. Winner. If I had candy, you would get it. <laughs> it's four. I'm allowed. Um, so uh, we, we really see that the decisions of the past have shaped and will shape, obviously, what we're experiencing now and then on into the future. 
Um, there are several African countries that are posed to follow in the footsteps of East Africa. But as my colleague yesterday from Pathfinder pointed out, there are also countries that were poised to reach the demographic dividend, did not make those investments, and did not reap the gains of the demographic dividend. I won't name the country. We're on tape. But it happens. <laughs> um, so it really depends, again, on the choices that they made today. And the investing in key interventions, including family planning and family planning for youth, again, think about that bulge. That's your largest population probably with the highest need. Um, will yield an immediate health dividend if you think about maternal and child mortality. Um, but in coupling these investments with increasing education investments in the others will help um, be able to seize the, the, the benefits of the demographic dividend. So to conclude, we can accelerate progress in youth and adolescents' sexual and reproductive health through strategic interventions. It has wider implications, as we saw on the previous slide, for ending poverty reduction. And we can do this. No, let me rephrase this. We cannot, and we could be any one of us in this room. We cannot do this alone. It's really going to be able to rely on alignment through strategic interventions with global partnerships, such as with Family Planning 2020. So the goal of Family Planning 2020, to be honest, is both ambitious, but it is attainable as well. And I think our collective contributions to Family Planning 2020 already have, have already uh, yielded uh, health benefits for women and girls and will really continue to contribute to the long-term development goals. So by integrating youth health needs into our work to bring women and girls and family planning information and services to the forefront, we can truly help the families, the communities, and the nations of this world prosper. Thank you. Thank you, Allie. So um, it's my pleasure also to turn to our last speaker, um, who is Hita Bajiani, and she is the country representative for Pathfinder International in Mozambique, uh, where she manages their overall portfolio of projects, um, uh, many of them having to do uh, with youth and adolescents. Um, Hita has worked uh, in a number of African countries on reproductive health, HIV, and family planning. Um, Angola, Ghana, Nigeria, Tanzania, uh, and Ethiopia. And she's originally from Brazil, where I first met her a very long time ago, and where um, she worked for many years as well on multi-sectoral programs um, and uh, project design, project management, um, and a lot of gender-based work around both um, HIV AIDS and, and, and family planning. And so um, uh, Heath is going to bring to us the experience that she has in Mozambique, um, partnering uh, both with the government and a wide range of stakeholders on adolescent and, um, uh, and youth health. Thank you. It is a watch here. Is it to be here? This watch? Okay. Oh, it's thanks. my watch, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks, Jennifer, for your nice words. And it's also nice to see a few of uh, old friends in the audience. Thanks for coming. Uh, thank you also to the Wilson Center for the opportunity and the other speakers for the insightful remarks in, in, in their presentations. In my presentation, I will take a more practical path, and I will look how this broad knowledge and AYSRH program plays out in reality in a country <laughs> setting. I hope to shed light on the process of advocating with uh, country governments, in-country donors, and other stakeholders to prioritize SRH needs and rights of adolescents and youth. Uh, in doing that, I would like to tell a bit of the story of Geração Bis, a multi-sectoral SRH program in Mozambique involving 
three ministries working together to bring adolescent and youth program to national scale. In looking at the Geração Biz story, I will explore three major themes of our work that bring this SRH youth program to scale. The three major themes were, were engaging the ministries, the role of the youth movement, and the donor coordination. And I will conclude with some lessons learned in the implications for today. First, I set the scene with some background data of Mozambique, share a little bit of the policy context, and an overview of the program. As you can see, Mozambique, with a population of 25 million people, is a young and rural country where adolescent and youth face challenges in accessing contraception and are vulnerable to HIV. Looking at the policy environment in any context, a supportive policy environment is critical to advancing the momentum and the programming around AY SRH. Pathfinder worked with various in-country partners to support the government in developing those policies as well as to build young people capacity to advocate for the need for those type of policies. The policies listed here contributed to the positive moment. Some were already in place and others were advocate and generated as part of our work. Now let's move to an overview of the Geração Bis program. Uh, Geração Bis program, it is a multi-sectoral adolescent and youth sexual reproductive health program implemented by the government of Mozambique with financial support of, from UNFPA, DANIDA, NORAD, SIDA, and the technical support from Pathfinder. PGB, as you can see, uses a multi-sectoral, multi-ministry approach around three key program strategies. Youth-friendly services under, implemented under the responsibility of the Ministry of of health, which comprise the establishment of a network of youth-friendly services within the public health systems. The services provided uh, uh, comprise, were very comprehensive, comprising counseling and services for contraception, HIV treatment, prenatal care, and other sexual and reproductive health services. Peer educators affiliated with the other two components, uh, the school-based program as well as the, the community outreach program, offered referrals as well as providing counseling at the youth-friendly services. The school-based program was under the responsibility of the Ministry of Education and included comprehensive sexual reproductive health information and counseling in schools. And the community-based education and community mobilization program was under the responsibility, is under the responsibility of the Minister of Youth and Sports in close collaboration with youth groups, youth CBOs, and to a later stage with youth-led civil society organizations. But as I mentioned in this presentation, I will focus on advocacy dynamics and look at the three major themes of the project that allowed us to effectively work with the government to bring this AY SRH program to scale and success successfully involve a range of stakeholders to the importance of youth to Mozambique development agenda. What were the major factors contributing to engage the ministries? Working with the ministries of health, education, youth and sports was essential to the success and continuation of Geração Bis. 
one of the major reasons that Geração Bis has lasted as long as it has since 1999, it is because of the three ministries pressuring each other to stay involved. Their involvement was mutually reinforcing. Not always a smooth coordination, but definitely an interesting dynamic. Coordination got strong with the consistent implementation of the multi-sectoral steering committee, with representation from each of the three ministries and to a later stage with the youth participants. The chair of the steering committee was a rotating position which helped keep all the ministries and participants engaged. The centralization of gov government decision-making power was also relevant as we need advocacy at central, district, provincial levels. And not less important was the provision of intensive technical assistance at central and provincial levels. We had dedicated technical advisors based in each of those ministries, both at central and provincial level. In addition to the mutually reinforcing system created by the involvement of the three ministries, the slowly and sh but surely growth of the youth participation contributed to create a youth movement, the Geração Bis, as we call it, which means a Bis generation, a generation that would be aware and concerned with IYS arrange issues. What was the role of the youth movement? Oh, sorry, I am too fast. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, what was the role of the youth movement? Youth is, all, are all, are, is always fast, and that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, the, the program initially focused on training and producing peer educators. They were equipped <laughs> with a set of tools comprising uh, manuals, uh, peer educator manuals, monitoring forms, t-shirt, cap, bags, and a series of uh, behavior changing materials. Later, we moved on to build the capacity of peer educators also as activists. This change were, was instrumental to engage youth to discuss their demands, needs, challenges, and expectations from civil society, government, and donor leaders. It's also allowed youth to, to have more voice and to tackle their programming issues. The youth movement, made up of more than 5,000 peer educators, was critical to the success of Geração Bis. Youth associations, as I said before, uh, were at a later stage involved in the steering committee and played a role in defining the agenda, advocate for its implementation, and actively participate in discussions around data and results. Moving now to the donor coordination, which was also an important feature of this program. UNFPA was in charge of communicating and coordinating with donors, and this was critical to our ability to bring in different bilateral donors. We were also able to secure additional small grants for, from donors who would you like to diversify the range of work? For instance, we were able to leverage uh, a small grant from World Bank to pilot uh, a service of offering HIV treatment to young people. Or we also uh, uh, mobilize more resources from Flanders to provide services focused on uh, GBV within existing program design. An important aspect of leveraging and keep donors was the investment in M&E, where we could be presenting and discussing with the donors the results of the program. Oh, sorry. 
<laughs> in conclusion, I would like to bring some reflections on the lessons learned and the implications for today. To have the government in the drive seat, along with intensive technical support, was crucial to have government investment in youth. The three ministries demonstrated some commitment through integrated policies and budgetary allocations. However, this requires a long time frame and long-term donor commitment that not always we can have both <coughs> simultaneously. As my colleague said before, health information disaggregation of data, it is also, it is also very important. Uh, health information or, uh, or the, ed, a, a, the health information system actually made adolescents and youth invisible due to the lack of uh, disaggregation for this age group in the uh, system and therefore missing relevant data to inform policies addressing specific age groups, especially adolescents. Examples of uh, Actions taken to overcome those barriers included advocacy efforts targeting the National Department of Statistics to make it a policy within MOH. Mm -hmm. It started to collect data uh, as, a, a, as a parallel system at youth friendly services supported by the program and then expand this to our youth friendly services and consolidate this data and uh, uh, at the strict provincial and central level. A more supportive policy for AY SRH is also crucial. For example, to address the challenge of the turnover of peer educators, school dropout, dropout especially for girls, the Minister of Education signed a commitment saying that peer educators who were, who have good grades in school they would have guaranteed a place in the next year and would not pay the fees. Mm -hmm. This was a, an important measure, especially to keep girls in school. A few more lessons learned. Uh, a multi-ministry and multi-sectoral approach can create a sustainable program. It is time intensive and uh, necessary to have a strong technical team that supported the ministries at provincial and district levels where each of them could implement programs activities within their respective sectors and levels. For scale up and sustainability of programs for young people, we need to both advocate and build the capacity. The two must go hand in hand. In conclusion, I hope that the highlights of the PGB program has illustrated the process of advocate with country governments, in-country donors, and other stakeholders to prioritize SRH needs and rights of adolescents and youth. There is no doubt that PGB has played a crucial role in putting the sexual and reproductive health needs of young people in Mozambique on the policy agenda. In addition, it has also contributed to increase availability of uh, YSRH information and services in a comprehensive and integrated manner. It actually mainstreamed AYSRH within the health system mm -hmm. and other health government programs. And this system's approach to youth program is critical to meet health and development goals. As we all know, uh, and it's, it seems as we ha have also uh, learned from the previous speaker, there is a need for more funding to youth programming. With the shift funding environment, it is important to maximize the opportunities to use donor funds to leverage other donors to youth programming. 
Thank you again for the opportunity of talking here and looking forward to continue this discussion. Muito obrigada, Rita. <laughs> and um, congratulations on uh, the program. To, it's, it's really wonderful to hear about something that has been so painstakingly built um, since 1999. And it's rare to see programs that have that kind of commitment and continuity. So congratulations on, on that program to you and to Pathfinder. Um, so I think that the panel really did a great job um, in a number of ways. One, in terms of showing some of the specificity and the complexity of each individual intervention um, that's needed uh, for, for youth health programming, and also in showing some of the uh, shared characteristics and the interconnectedness between those interventions uh, for the overall benefit of, of youth and adolescents. And I thought there were also some interesting themes um, that could be further explored um, that went across technology, youth and the use of technology being one, also measurement issues um, highlighted by all the speakers, and then the question of engagement and ownership. Um, so uh, I thought um, the panel did a great job, and um, it's now your turn um, for those of you uh, sitting in the audience to uh, have the chance to um, ask them some uh, questions or um, highlight uh, some part of their contribution that you want to hear more about. Um, so I will um, uh, kind of uh, call on people. I think, is there a mic? Yes. And then please um, identify yourself uh, just very quickly before you ask the question. Hi. Uh, thank you. Is this on? Hi, uh, so thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine Zuck. I work with the World Faiths Development Dialogue. So my question is following up on this idea of behavior change in these programs, right? Because in some cases, um, family planning programs, reproductive health programs are already offered, but only to married couples, right? And so this idea of extending them to youth is often seen as maybe like perverting the youth, right? So how do you deal with some of these social and cultural barriers? Um, and do you at all engage with religious leaders in these countries or in your experience? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe what we'll do is take um, a few questions and then um, ask the panelists um, to respond to the ones that they um, have something to contribute to. So maybe we'll take a couple more questions. This person here had a question. Hi, sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Masaibi. I am a business development intern at Futures Group, and I, Rita, I know that you mentioned the fact that um, a lot of donors, uh, you have a lot of lack of funding towards these programs. Um, do you think that the way this issue is framed should be reconsidered in the long term, um, and the fact that a lot of donors are more focused on the short term goals rather than long term, and should we really kind of reframe it as being like a huge HIV prevention effort rather than a youth-led organizational effort? <laughs> And then um, question down here. Thank you very much. Um, is it working? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I'm Regina Benevides. I'm from the E2A project, and uh, thank you very much for really good, provoking thoughts. And uh, I would like to touch in one point, which was really talked uh, among all of you, which is about the youth engagement or the youth participation. And uh, for us in each way, this is uh, a masterpiece as well. We are developing some programs in this area. And um, many times when we think about the youth participation, we think of them like being peer educators. This is the most common mm -hmm. way that we think about them. So, but most of the times we also know that we have low evidence that they can really do their job the best they can because most of the times they are the beneficiaries. They, they are the ones that uh, are, have the most the benefits of that. So I would like to hear a little more uh, your thoughts about what would be other strategies to be really engaging them as a pillar, as you said, in the youth engagement in this agenda. Thank you very much. So why don't we take these questions and then we'll come back and ask some more. But we don't want the um, panelists to forget the questions. So um, uh, maybe we'll just go in turn and, and each of you can address which parts of these that um, you think you have something to, to really contribute. Nina, you want to go first? Uh, sure. And, and 
but I won't take long. So I think the question around behavior change, I mean, certainly, um, I mean, the challenge here is that PEPFAR uh, walks a pretty narrow line around how we specifically invest in family planning. So I think the real issue for us around engaging local leaders has been more around HIV prevention and talking about sex and sexuality with young people. And I think it really varies. In some places, one of the leading edges of this has been around male circumcision where in order to really build local enthusiasm for this as an intervention, we've had to reach deep into the community um, to work with people who are community thought leaders because often male circumcision is strongly associated with a certain religion or cultural practice. And if you don't share that, it seems like a weird thing to do. So I think, you know, on the ground, we're learning a lot about that. But if you want to be effective at that, you really have to go at a pretty, like, local level. You can't have a big mm -hmm. kind of national policy because then you're, or global policy because then you're running counter to the whole need to work at a local level. Um, I think around reframing from longer to shorter term goals, Masavi, I think that, um, you know, it really depends on the donor, right? And and what you often can do is look at a single intervention that yields both. So, for example, we know that when we help girls stay in school, we reap pretty short-term goals of helping them avoid HIV infection. Girls who are in school are much less likely to be HIV infected. But education is a long-term investment in that woman's life. So and some, go some donors will really invest long-term in that way, and others invest in the short-term. So, you know, I, it sounds to me like and I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of the program in Mozambique until I am coached. But it sounds, <laughs> it sounds to me like, you know, you're hitting both the short-term and the longer-term goals there, you know, because we know that youth themselves are a short and long-term mm -hmm. project. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we can do both. So, yeah, I'll stop with that. And then the peer educator, I want to think about that a little more. <laughs> Kevin. Okay. So I'll just talk a little bit about um, the social and cultural differences and how you're going to tell people who maybe have a mindset that youth are not supposed to be engaged sexually that really they are engaged sexually. So the first thing is like, I think about two panelists mentioned the age disintegration of data. Because if a country has data representing women in general and men in general concerning lack of family planning services, concerning HIV and AIDS, concerning maternal mortality, child mortality, or whatever, which doesn't specify which age group has a problem. Because I don't believe that anybody who is reasonable and understands that this is a problem would not want to do something about it. So it's generally about advocacy, like really bringing out the data and facts that this is a problem among adolescents and teens. It's not just about married people. So that is a way of changing social and cultural norms. Just, just wanted to talk a little bit about that. Then for youth engagement, um, besides being peer educators, one thing which is also, um, let's say, important is the fact that youth are able to realize that there is a problem. It's the same thing. If you realize that there's a problem, you want to do something about it. One thing about... Um, say involvement of youth is say um let me just give an example you're looking for um what can i say some a research assistant or something like that concerning some project or something which involves youth now if all the if you never find a youth or somebody within that age group who can actually fit the job qualifications then that's something to say that youth need to be educated in that line so besides them being peer educators you can actually invest in their education so that they can in turn work in sexual and productive health and rights so i think that that's one way that you can engage youth with without necessarily without them being um, peer educators another thing is um Besides, let's say, medical practitioners, you do have um, lawyers or actresses or whatever. The idea is whatever field they're in, they should be aware that there is a problem with relation to sexual and reproductive health. And the, in, that, in their field, they're able to do something about it. A little example is just like films and everything. I mean, youth pay attention to films, they follow what they watch. So if the youth acting in the films are aware of these problems and they're able to depict it in this way. Mm -hmm. So it's true, it's somehow about education, but it's a different form of peer, peer education or peer-to-peer -peer education in which you're actually demonstrating something. 
and uh, well, you can get all the other different vocations that youth that who are already trained because we're looking at training youth and youth who are already trained in their different vocations, paying attention to these things, and in whatever line of work they're doing, they're able to focus on it. Well, for now, that's what I can think about. So, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I wanted to take a moment to talk about the issue of peer to peer, and I think there are some concerns about what really can be done through this model equally with the youth friendly services and so forth. But a lot, at least from USAID's point of view, um, doesn't also just have to be the here and the now of a program of an activity, that we also take the viewpoint of talking about building a future. So I can equally the idea of education, um, but there are programs such as YALI, which is the Young African Leadership Initiative, and that really looks forward mm -hmm. about how do you build the leadership. So you may not have the dynamic youth leadership you have, but how do you grow that? And taking the longer term viewpoint mm -hmm. and investing in the future and not just with the current leaders, but looking at the future leaders. So I have seen in other countries as well in talking about advocacy that um, a lot of us do par uh, policy work with parliamentarians and with other government leaderships and go to advocate. Um, but for areas such as uh, the Rights of the Child and the Age of Marriage Acts in several countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, I've seen youth coalitions that will come forward to be part of that advocacy mm -hmm. block mm -hmm. um, to be able mm -hmm. to impact their, their own. And I think for some, to some extent probably hold a lot more weight um, than others that would go forward. So I think there really are some good um, examples of how we can talk about youth in a meaningful way uh, about growing our future um, beyond uh, some of the traditional um, approaches. Okay, thanks. I, um, I think when we are talking about uh, um, contraception and young people, né? uh, I think there is a difference if you were talking about contraception, young people, and family planning, and, and young people. There are, two, 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 there are two, two, two different concepts. And it is interesting, we have uh, conducted a, uh, a recent uh, study to develop an intervention focused on increasing um, uptake of contraception among young people and the way uh, uh, the, 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 the research indicated to us that it was not a, a question of marriage or not marriage. It was youth with children and youth without children. That's how we were addressing uh, 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 contraceptive messages, uh, information on contraception to uh, try to using a MES system uh, to increase uptake of contraception. And so I think this is, uh, it is important to, to, for us also to continue uh, 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 listen from the young people and how they see those things and then to prepare intervention that are more responsive to the needs. But in talking about uh, 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 this issue, another area that it is very important to, to, be, to, to be taking into consideration is, is the service provision and how are the services prepared to offer in this service. Uh, I, I think this also plays a key factor and, uh, and uh, probably in some areas much more important than, than community leadership is the way they are treated at those services. Um, in, in relation to the whether or not uh, we would frame it, uh, change the frame to long term, uh, uh, definitely I think the Geração BIS program uh, 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 illustrates uh, uh, the need to, to, to think in the long term and I think it showed that it, it, was, it, it is possible. But I think crucial to that, it is the leadership of the government, the leadership of the, young, the, the, of the youth movement in, in dialoguing, in having a clear agenda and, uh, and be able to, to negotiate with the government and the donor community the, the support for the plans. Mm. I think I would, yeah. Great, thank you. So, um, you, 
Yes. <laughs> I'm <laughs> taking <laughs> advantage of sitting right here with Mike <laughs> to make sure my question gets it because I know there's a few more. So I want to be brief, but I wanted to make sure that um, that you to see if you were interested in answering this as well, Jennifer. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's that I feel like I heard um, a number of principles when we talked about these strategic priorities of USAID's come out in these discussions. You know, we've talked about youth engagement. Um, we've talked about the diversity of youth, whether it's those living with HIV or whether it's males or whether it's younger adolescents versus older adolescents. Um, and we've also talked, um, especially heard a bit from uh, Catherine about human rights. So would you say that there's a particular principle, and I'll call those principles, that's the most important? So it's a hard question. Um, or is it, is that, is, can we answer it even? Is there one particular principle or is there something that we didn't blatantly, or I didn't blatantly list as a principle that's a, the most important? Mm -hmm. So That's a good question, yeah. yeah. It's a hard one. I don't want to answer it. <laughs> Maybe we'll let the panel reflect for a moment. Yeah, <laughs> take more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say one word about a question that was asked before, and that's about um, working with religious leaders. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, um, uh, I, I do want to comment on that because, yes, USAID has worked with religious leaders um, as well as um, OGAC and I'm sure many of the institutions uh, represented here. Sometimes that work is at a very high policy and political level. So it's aimed at um, discussing with very key, um, often quite intellectual leaders in a country about whether or not Islam opposes family planning or Islam is okay with family planning. And I think that's one way of engagement. I think it's been a very important way of engagement. I was involved in Senegal with a, a, a much different type of engagement, which was about relationship building with religious leaders. And these weren't religious leaders at the national level, but very much at the community level. And uh, we wanted to work with these, uh, with these leaders because in Senegal, many, many um, uh, young uh, kids, uh, up until the age of about 12, go to Quranic schools. They're called Dara. And um, they're small, they're in the cities, but also in the rural areas. And the children are left there sometimes for a period of up to two, two to three years where they memorize the Quran. And sometimes for some of these kids, it's the only schooling that they get. Some of them go on to other school, many of them don't. Um, but it was, it was a question of, of, of going to them. And that actually proved to be difficult, sometimes hard even to locate them because they were in very, very remote places, um, sometimes very small schools, sometimes quite big schools. And I think in building a relationship um, with uh, religious leaders of this type in the community, you have to start from where they are. And you have to think about something that they want or need. And in our case, that was actually food aid. Um, to be able to uh, support and um, give food to these kids in the um, educational institutions that they were running. So we started off um, thinking about this and approaching them with something that we thought could actually contribute to the well-being of the kids in their charge, but also help them in their administration and in achieving the goals that they had as, um, as the leaders of these Quranic schools. And then from that, we were able to build, um, after some relationship and some trust had been built, um, and some awareness of who they were and who we were on their part, able to build um, a platform be for being able to talk about um, more controversial issues. So why don't we have some more questions, because um, I saw a number of hands um, uh, previously. So uh, let's see, we can uh, maybe start down here and then work to the back. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, I have the mic. Okay, um, Kate Lane, I'm with USAID and Youth Advisor. Um, one of the things that I think is, is a challenge, and I think some of you kind of alluded to it in your presentations, I certainly Catherine did, Nina and Allie, um, is the challenge of trying to get some of our programs to, to get into this age disaggregation, to focus in on some of these priority populations, like the young women 15 to 19. And we tend to see in our programs sort of all women writ large, 15 to 49, and yet when you start to zero in and you see where the risk is greatest um, with the, the key pops or in the, um, the, the, the adolescent mothers in terms of maternal mortality and child, morta child morbidity mortality and family planning higher levels of unmet need, how do, we, mm -hmm. how do we try to elevate that issue so we're not just sort of looking at sort of, you know, this sort of broad swath of women, but being able to really zero in on some of those key priority populations where if we did intervene, we'd probably get a bigger bang for our buck. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. 
I think there are two questions here. Yep. Thank you. I'm Hannah Claus from the Teen Star Program. You know, youth is not a static thing. And the way you're talking about the statistics, it seems to me, you know, as if you're, you're almost frozen in time segments. And I'm wondering, are we looking at demographic winter the, the way you have it in Russia, for instance? Mm -hmm. Have you given any thought to that? Can you ask the que that last part again? Are we, are we looking at what? Demographic winter. Winter. Mm -hmm. the, the very top-heavy pyramid of very old people, especially those who have no family in Russia. Thank you. Um, my question is somewhat of a follow-up to what you were talking about, Jennifer, with wants and needs. Um, it seems to me that the policy discourse is very centered on eradication and prevention and addressing issues that are perceived as problems. But sexuality is also about pleasure. And I was wondering if in any of the interventions that you have come across in the course of your work, and this is not directed at any one person on the panel, you've found that youth engagement also centers on sex-positive language. <laughs> Wouldn't that be refreshing? <laughs> <laughs> that could be one of the top principles, too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Yes. She wanted to ask the question. Thank you. Um, my name is Grace. <laughs> I'm an Atlas School Fellow from Malawi and serving at Population Action International. Um, my question is around male involvement. Um, a lot of times when we talk about sexual and reproductive health, um, it's mainly talked in line with women or girls or females. And there's now I think uh, a lot is being said or raised um, around male involvement in a lot of our programming on issues related to women. And from your experiences in the different work that you're doing, um, how has male involvement come up? And are there any like good examples um, of how that has been uh, effective in addressing issues to do with sexual and reproductive health for youth? And also looking into the future, how can we more and more involve men, um, rather male, the male, um, in the work that we're doing to address sexual and reproductive health for youth? Because youth is really both men and female, male and female. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see. So we take the one last question here, and then I think we ha are probably going to run out of time. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm sure our speakers will stay um, for a few minutes extra if you don't get your question in. Uh, I'm Linnea Zimmerman, and I'm with PMA 2020. And first, Catherine, I'm sorry that I missed you at the train station. We were supposed to ride together. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, um, being part of PMA 2020, which is this new initiative to do population-based surveys, um, in the beginning you mentioned that there's a need for research, but there hasn't really, none of the presentations, which were all excellent, by the way, um, really talked about the knowledge gaps. And so I'm curious, um, what are the main knowledge gaps? What are the questions that population-based surveys, which are you know, a different animal, can't get too sensitive generally, what should we be asking? Um, and I can't promise anything for PMA, but what are those questions that we should be asking of adolescents to address those gaps? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe what we'll do is uh, kind of reverse the order this time and ask Keita if she would uh, comment on some of these questions. First. Yeah. There were so many. Yeah. I don't know if I remember. I, I don't know if I remember all of them. <laughs> well, okay, <laughs> we'll see. The ones you want to Yes, I, I, yeah, I guess so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of the, the young people and, uh, and sexuality, uh, uh, the, mm, in the Geração Bis program, we we do not only discuss uh, the, the 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 unpleasant things. Of course, that uh, actually, I think many of them 
jo uh, the, those young people join Geração Bees, uh, hoping to discuss much more of the pleasant things. Né? And, uh, uh, and it was part of uh, uh, the training curriculum. Né? It was very comprehensive in terms of uh, it, it did include sexuality. It does include sexuality, it does include uh, sexual orientation uh, and uh, sexual rights. Uh, uh, so, and a, a lot, there is, there is a lot of uh, information in the discussion about those uh, topics in a, in, in a, in a way that uh, it is being uh, educative and without prejudice and that allows them to learn about and to feel comfortable to do those things. So I think in the Geração Biz program we tried to really also to discuss uh, not only about pregnancy prevention uh, uh, or HIV prevention, but also uh, their, about their sexual lives too. Okay. Um, in relation to the, what else, let me see the questions of the youth involvement, uh, the, the male involvement. It is interesting that uh, uh, we had, uh, we, it was hard, we had to develop a specific strategy to have girls involvement because uh, in the I, maybe it, it might be different né, in programs with the youth and, and programs with the the more the, with men and women uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, youth male involvement and a lot of them partic participating in the program. We, we, our, our challenge were, was to bring the females, to have peer educators as, as females. They, they were the ones who would drop out. They were the ones who were not allowed to come and to stay. Uh, so the, the males were were always there, and uh, in I, I think I think it is it, uh, this is two different issues when we are com uh, doing programs with these two groups of people. I think male there is much less issues in in youth uh, male youth involvement in SRH. Mm. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm just going to some of the questions made me really think about the point that how are we treating youth? Is it youth as this is youth, it's one entity? Um, but we know that the needs of the adolescents are not the same. Um, they're not the same. They could be married, they could be single, they could be uh, not married with children, and their reproductive and sexual health needs are not the same. And I think we really need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about our programming. Um, it made me think of the example of Tanzania, and Ula is here from Mary Stopes in Tanzania and can speak to that as well, but when we started talking to the youth um, about family planning, they said, the lang they made the point that the language we use when we speak about family planning, when we communicate, when we talk to youth, matters. Because for a lot of them, they're not interested in family planning. They don't want to have a family plan. They don't want to have a family. They want to be a student. They want to. They have dreams, and it's not about family planning. So even the terminology when you're dealing with the youth matters. And so it's the con you know the contraception needs or the education needs that they have. It's not just talking about family planning. Um, so that to me was was something to, to for us all to think about that we shouldn't think about it as a static population and why it really matters because if we speak to them the way that what we normally would about family planning they're going to look at us rightfully so like we're from the moon or something because mm -hmm. we're not we're not even on the same page. Um, to the uh, woman who asked about male involvement, I think I actually heard you say you're from Malawi. <laughs> So I think one of the better, better or best examples I've seen of male involvement is in Malawi. Uh, Johns Hopkins um, communication program uh, had a, a male engagement and male involvement program there under the B Bridge Project that was probably about seven years ago, looking at men as a gatekeeper and realizing that men very much were a gatekeeper, did the baseline, did the research, and realized that men actually never knew that they had a right to be involved um, in their families' lives, 
it was a matrilineal society. I mean, it has it's very complicated not to go into here, but it actually was a very successful program and empowering men to be able to realize they could be active, positive actors within the family and the household for health. Um, so I would suggest if people are interested, you could probably find that on JHU's website. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Okay, um, I'm first going to talk about sexuality as pleasure because it was, very, it was a very important point. Um, I know a lot of people grow up, uh, well, a lot of youth just have this idea because of society to think sex is like a bad thing. So actually when you have sex, whether you get pregnant or not, it's like a real big problem. So I would like to say personally, I did have to study about sex like two years ago. Like I realized I knew nothing. I just realized that it's just like a taboo. So it's just a problem, but it's not really a problem. And um, given my background and what I had to do, I, you needed to be able to explain that sex is a good thing, but the problem is what is associated maybe with not being able to have contraceptive or not having the right knowledge and the right. So it's all about sexual and reproductive health information. Because the truth is whether you tell youth that sex is bad or not, or they think it's bad or not, they will still have sex. So they're gonna have sex and feel bad about it for a very, very long time and keep running around in circles and getting pregnant or not, but the fact is they're gonna have sex, that's the fact about it. So I actually have friends who, of course, maybe had sex before marriage, but the thing is in marriage, it just loses all its pleasure and everything just because you don't even know what it's about. And so they come to me complaining because they are married and they think it's supposed to be a good thing in marriage. Not that, not because they got married as um, virgins, not like they didn't have sex before. They're just asking you in marriage because they think it's a good thing in marriage and they need to understand how it's a good thing in marriage at that time. But really it's very important to make young people understand, myself included, that sex is actually a good thing and they're going to do it anyway so you might as well just tell them what it's about because a girl as young as 10 starts uh, having all these feelings and liking boys and things like that and having all these thoughts it's a reality and if she's not aware of what's happening by 11 she's gonna get pregnant it's a fact like the, it's a biological thing there are hormones and all this so we cannot ignore the fact that sex is actually a good thing and we just I guess we just need to tell, we just need to know what it's about, like the information is the issue. Okay, then I'm, I'm gonna talk about, um, okay, okay, um, male involvement. Well, like she said, really, like from all the pictures I showed, most of them were like male, I just had like one female. So I don't think they are not particularly involved. I mean, it's true, looking at it from the angle of how are we touching on um, male, maybe MSM, for example, maybe that was not covered, but men actually implement as being involved as in youth. Well, I think they are to an extent, as in um, the people to be targeted, maybe not so much, but as in those implementing, I think they're quite involved. I don't know. And then, um, I want, okay, I wanted to talk about how do we zoom in? Like all these programs talking about 15 to 49 years old, how do we zoom in? I just have like one proposition. Well, if the youth are actually involved in the development of the programs, trust me, they are going to stand up for what they know is their right. So they are going to insist, like, if I'm, well, if I am involved in the development of a program, I'll make sure that this particular age group is particularly represented. It may be biased, but, you know, what I'm just saying is if youth are there, they would make sure that there is that zooming in factor. Um, there's one, okay, the last question, the question about principles. <laughs> I'm not going to give you an answer because I'm not too sure <laughs> what answer you require, but I just want to say there's really a conflict between principles and values and reality. Because I'm a Christian and when I started working, I was, I mean, there are all these values that I really have to, and, and I know are facts, but then when I see the reality, I really question myself, like seriously, what is it about, what is, what is the principle really? Like personally, besides the fact that, for example, besides the fact that abortion is illegal, I wouldn't do it because I'm a Christian. But when I see what happens in effect, I, still, I ask myself, what's the principle really? It's a principle solving a reality or the principle is something that existed before the reality or the principle is supposed to be, I don't know. So <laughs> I can't answer that. <laughs> Oh, it's so good, isn't it? Uh, okay, so I'm going to tackle this. I'm going to try tackling this, Sandeep. And I'm, uh, I'm going to say something that um, will bug some people, but I think the most important principle is does it work? Mm -hmm. You know, we can't afford in this fiscal environment to spend money on things 
because we know they're right if we can't get the result that we need. There's like a world of things that are right to do, and then within that world, there's a subset of things that are right to do that also work, and that's where we really have to focus. And that's where the short versus long-term issue comes in. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you define what works? But we have to have that. That's the conversation, mm -hmm. I think, that has to happen. And then um, I want to talk a little bit about surveys and data and the relationship between that and homing in. So. You know, it's true that surveys can be limited in the kinds of sensitive questions they ask, but the DHS has a gender-based violence module. You know, you can train mm -hmm. um, people to ask those difficult questions. You have to understand the quality of the data will be limited, but we still get really amazing reporting out of that. And I think one of the reasons this is important for adolescents is that we talk about sex as if it were one thing, right? But if you... Um, if your first sexual experience was being assaulted or was being um, abused by uh, a member of your family and someone asks you, you know, how many partners have you had, right? That's a very different answer from your mind than from our mind, right, as people working in public health. And so I think, you know, that's an example. That's the first example that came to me of the kind of questions that I think where we're not, we're not getting the data that we think we're getting or the data we're getting isn't telling us the whole picture because we're using a very uh, overly generalized notion of sex. So in this arena, I think that might be important. And then um, just to kind of, and then I think once we have that, then we can have these programs at home in a little better. You know, we asked PEPFAR programs this year to start defining priority populations for prevention and our program, they have worked so hard and every year we ask them for 18 new things it's crazy so I don't mean to I don't want to be critical but you know someone as a country comes back and says you know females 15 to 49 that's a that you can't prioritize that population <laughs> it's, it's too many and so we have to know you know which which are the which youth even you know even if we just look 15 to 24 in a country like Tanzania yeah. that is too many young women for mm -hmm. us to get our hands around we need to know which ones and it's by it's that it's getting that data and also IBBS type data to really hone in on what are the behaviors of the women, young women who are most at risk, where are they, and young men. And then the last piece about male involvement. So I think the <laughs> dividing line is the clinic versus the community. Mm -hmm. So when you're in the community, you can get young men to engage. You know, we did all these youth programs mm -hmm. early in PEPFAR, and it was all like men in their 20s and even in their 30s who were coming, and we could never get the girls to come. But then when you look at who goes to get health care, it's women. Right, and it's very hard to get men to go to the clinic. And it's a problem both in terms of men as gatekeepers for women getting health care, but it's also a problem for men themselves. You know, and this is one of the things, there are these big debates about male circumcision and whether all this money was going to men. And I kept saying, you know, every man who gets infected with HIV is a tremendous risk for the women and children in his life. It's not just his life, right? It's the lives that he touches. And this is the problem with thinking only in terms of a single population is that they all go together. Mm -hmm. So when we prevent a man from getting HIV, we're also protecting his wife and his children. And frankly, we're protecting her from months and months and months of taking care of him. Sorry to overgeneralize, but that's the way it goes. So, you know, I think what, what um, was Grace, I think what Grace was talking about is how do you get the men to sort of engage in the, in the care itself so that they're invested in their, in their partners getting good medical care and their children children getting good medical care. And I, I think we've figured out some things about that that work, and we've also figured out some things that don't work. So saying, you know, when you're pregnant, if you come to A and C and you bring a partner, you'll get tested faster, you know, that doesn't work because then a woman will just grab a guy off the street and bring her into A and C so she doesn't have to wait in line as long. I mean, I would do that. Dude, <laughs> be my husband. <laughs> Half an hour. So, um, so we have to... We, we know what we want to ha have happen, and, we, and, and figuring out how to make that happen, I think, is, is, a, is a big, big challenge. And we need, we, need more, uh, we need more men to think about getting men to engage. But the other thing to say is, you know, it, where we do get both genders engaged in the sexual health of one, everything goes better. You know, so where women are engaged in getting men to... Um, get circumcised or getting their sons to get circumcised, things go better. And we don't think about mothers. It does not go well. So uh, a, I think Grace is on to something that's important, and it's a challenge to figure that out. I don't know what to do about demographic winter, so I'm passing. <laughs>
Um, I'd like to just uh, address very quickly um, a couple of the uh, comments about um, research and knowledge gaps, just so that I let everybody know about a couple of things um, that have just happened and that are upcoming. One of them that I think might be of interest to this audience is um, a publication from the International Center for Research on Women um, that was supported by USAID to look at the impact of conditional cash transfers on girls' education. Um, and this is an uh, a, a province in India that for four years, um, had a program to pay uh, for girls to stay in school, and they paid it at the end, mm -hmm. not at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So it was a very interesting experiment and a lot of interesting information in this report and a later report that will come out in, um, in 2015 looks at the impact of these conditional cash transfers on delaying age at marriage. Um, there's also um, a report coming out in a couple of weeks by the Population Council, um, specifically looking at um, the HIV-related vulnerabilities of adolescent girls in Ethiopia. And this report focused um, specifically on um, the most vulnerable young population uh, for HIV in Ethiopia, adolescent girls who are married and those who live um, are urban migrants and live in slums. So I do think there's a lot that we don't know. Um, there's a lot more to find out. I think it's important to do that. And at the same time, I think meetings like this and the ideas that were exchanged contribute a lot to beginning to move forward, um, both on the research side and also on the practical side. So I'd like to really thank the panel um, for all of their contributions and also um, thank the audience for many uh, very great and stimulating questions. So thank you. Thank you.